If God exists, I want to know. If God does not exist, I want to know. Either way, I doubt I'll ever know. But still, I pursue that which I cannot catch. I may hope God exists, but I must never permit hope to fog reason. Trained in science, I respect rational, logical, critical ways of thinking, even about God, especially about God. I do not mean that the process of science can prove or disprove God, no. The scientific method, in principle, is not applicable. But I do mean that rational, logical, critical ways of thinking about God may be useful, clarifying questions, revealing problems, suggesting insights. What are the limits? How to think rationally, logically, critically about God? The way of thinking is called metaphysics. Can metaphysics discern God? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. To try to discern God, why recruit metaphysics? I know metaphysics has baggage. The word can connote pre-scientific speculations and occult screeds. Such archaic or bizarre metaphysics is not what I mean. Contemporary analytical metaphysics seeks to discover and comprehend the most fundamental features of the world, the most general elements of existence. So can analytical metaphysics help me in my personal, perhaps peculiar, pursuit of God? To begin, I go to Oxford, England, to meet a metaphysician who focuses on God's essence and traits, Brian Leftow. Brian is a committed believer who seeks to bring rigorous thinking to claims about God. Can he make progress? Brian, are there ways that metaphysics, the deep use of analytic philosophy, can really help us to, to discern what God is all about? I think so. Metaphysics tries to study the way things are in a very abstract, general way. Sometimes, in working on a metaphysical problem, you find that a certain role needs to be played, and that role starts to look a bit godlike. Uh, one person who found this was Alfred North Whitehead, uh, an English metaphysician from the beginning of the last century. Whitehead had the view that all of reality just consists of experiences, but he also had the thought that there were Platonic ideal forms of things. You know, for example, there was an ideal beauty, an ideal truth, you know, that numbers were somehow ideal objects. Now, you've got the view that there are these ideal objects, and you've got the view that everything there is is nothing but experiences. And let's say he had arguments for both those things. Well, to put those things together, what you need is an experience where all those ideal objects are going to be there. And since they're Platonic ideal objects, they're going to be there eternally. So you need an eternal experience. Well, simplicity dictates getting by with just one of them. So you've got one eternal experience in which all the Platonic ideals are just there. That is starting to look very much like what St. Augustine understood God to be. And so Whitehead, proceeding just by giving a general metaphysical description of things, wound up isolating a role for God to play. I myself have done something somewhat similar. I've looked into the nature of possibility and necessity, and I've asked, well, what is it that makes things possible? Uh, a good general answer for that is that what makes something possible is, is that there be a power able to bring it about. You know, why was it possible that I exist? Because my parents have the power to beget me and so on. That seems like a good answer to that question. Well, then if you're going to generalize that answer, apply it to every possibility, you're going to need powers able to bring about every possibility. Well, guess what? That's just what omnipotence is supposed to contain, power enough for that. So your, your analysis begins with the general features of the world. There are possibilities and then infers and develops an argument that seems to require something like a god as you proceed along the process. Right, right. Can we use metaphysics not just to uh, suggest that such a perfect being as God may exist, but to try to discern what that being, if that being exists, is like? Perfect being theology is a metaphysical procedure. And so if you can do that, certainly you can use metaphysics to characterize God. 
You can also read some characterizations of God out of the metaphysical argument you give that sort of pushes you toward his existence. For example, if God is really going to be the ground of all possibility, he's going to be the ground of every possible world. And from that, you can get pretty readily to the conclusion that God must exist necessarily. He's got to be there in every possible world if he's the ground of every possible world. If he exists necessarily, he's going to exist eternally since he can't not exist. If he exists necessarily, he's going to be an immaterial thing because no material object exists necessarily. Okay, so this is good because now that you have God necessarily existing, you're now being able to rigorously uh, define other properties which may not have been obvious to begin with but are directly derivative, are logical conclusions of God being a necessity. Right. So right. one is God existing eternally and one is that God cannot be material. Right. Okay, any others? From necessity, I think those are the main ones you can get with a very strong argument. So integrating it all together, what can metaphysics tell us about God? Metaphysics can tell us that God plays certain basic roles in what you might call the economy of reality. In my particular metaphysics, it can tell us that God exists necessarily. And from that, you can derive that he exists eternally and immaterially, which are pretty strong conclusions derived on a purely philosophical basis. Brian brings insight, what it means for God, if there is a God, to exist necessarily. A strong conclusion indeed, if, one, the conclusion follows from the arguments, and two, the arguments are based on premises that are sound. I focus on the premises. Are there premises from which a deductive argument can lead to God? I'd be surprised, shocked really, what, after about 3,000 years of philosophers thinking about God, finally one argument works? I don't think so. Best I speak to a metaphysician who is not a believer. Still at Oxford, I meet a philosopher known for teasing big ideas out of modest topics, John Hawthorne. John, fundamentally, how can metaphysics help us to discern what God is if indeed there is a God. I don't think you should be hoping that metaphysicians are going to figure out that there's a God. But there's something that, you know, analytical techniques uh, are useful for. Think about whether notions like uh, omnipotence and omniscience are uh, coherent and what constraints those ideas put on other things. Right, so, right. you know, given that omnipotence doesn't require that God can make rocks he can't lift, what does it require such that it even has some coherent hope of being right. true? And similarly, on the uh, omniscient side, one famously important question is whether God's foreknowledge of the future is somehow incompatible with some ideas we have about free will. Right. Does it make sense to suppose that it's really deeply up to me whether I punch you right now <laughs> and also that God foreknows right now whether I will or not. Yeah. Certainly with various other ideas in the Judeo-Christian tradition concerning the nature of God, there's similarly been uh, efforts made to clarify and, uh, and uh, inquire whether the ideas are even coherent, the simplicity of God, the perfection of God, and so on and so on. That's exactly my hope. I certainly do not hold any hope that, that philosophy or metaphysics or thinking theoretically can determine whether there is a God or even help me, but it can determine that if there is a God, what that God might have to be like. Yes, but if there is a God, that doesn't mean that God has to have the characteristics that have been attributed to him in a no. tradition. If, if the characteristics are incoherent, we know exactly. that no being has them. Exactly. If they're coherent, there's no guarantee that God has them. I totally agree. Yeah. But, but by, by getting coherent characteristics, we limit the characteristics to a possible, what a possibly yes. existent God must have. God must be constrained by that limitation. God must have, must only have coherent ca uh, uh, characteristics that are possible okay. for a being okay. to have. So that's just, kind of what you're saying. Right, right. That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. So let me give you just one example that atheists and theists go, go at loggerheads on. So uh, an atheist would say it is not rational to think that the complexity of the world can be built and created 
by a God who is simple. We need a, a God that's even more complex in the world to make a complex world. Whereas theists would say, we want as simple a God as possible to make a complex world. You have to get straight on what this uh, ideology of simplicity comes to. I mean, one aspect of the thing is that God isn't a thing with parts. But saying that a thing is simple in the sense of not having a proliferation of parts isn't saying that, yet saying that a thing is simple in terms of its qualitative richness. A number doesn't have any parts, but there's all sorts of interesting things that you can <laughs> say about pi. And in saying those, you're not presupposing that the number has meriological complexity, I mean complexity of part and whole. Yeah. So there's at least, it's at least not straightforward how to tie together these two notions of simplicity. But is this, is this a, a place where metaphysics can play a role to, to discern? Well, I'm helping you, aren't I? I'm trying well, to, I'm trying you know, to clarify some I, I need things. A, I then, need a lot of help. You know, and then, but I do think uh, metaphysicians are well-placed to clarify and to point out logical and evidential connections between initially disparate areas. That's something that uh, metaphysicians have historically done very well and will continue to do. Strengths those ideas put on other things. So, you know, I know John's right. I shouldn't be hoping that metaphysics can get me to God. But yet, I'm looking for small gems, making tiny cracks in the intellectual edifice that denies God. John offers me the number pi, showing how the richness of pi itself simple may hint at how great simplicity can engender great complexity. This encourages me. In thinking about God, metaphysics can suggest novel ideas. But even taken all together, they are tiny, a crumb of an argument. Is there an example where metaphysics can generate large arguments for God, arguments that can withstand contemporary criticism? I speak with a theologian trained in physics, a Catholic priest in the Jesuit order, and a philosopher of science, Father Robert Spitzer. Not like anyone. Robert, are there any modern philosophical arguments that you think carry weight to demonstrate God exists? Yes, um, there are three kinds of philosophical arguments. Normally a philosophical argument is not so reliant upon observational or measured observational data uh, like the science is. It, it generally is trying to describe things from the set of all reality, as it were. In the set of all reality, there'd have to be either uh, one, one or more unconditioned existence, or no unconditioned existence. So it's what, what does that mean, an unconditioned existence? Uh, oh, uh, uh, well, <laughs> we'll get uh, an unconditioned is like an uncaused existent. Okay. A conditioned existent is one that depends on the fulfillment of conditions for its existence. Right. An unconditioned existent would have um, no uh, conditions that need to be fulfilled. It could exist in and through itself. So it, when you look at a metaphysical argument, uh, what you wind up having is you show that there has to be at least one unconditioned reality, otherwise there would be nothing in the set of all reality, and, and that can be logically demonstrated, and then you proceed to say there can only be one, you can prove that, and that that one has to be unrestricted and the continuous creator of all else that is. The second is from the pure intelligibility of being. The proof basically runs like this. If reality is completely intelligible, then an unrestricted act of understanding exists. But reality is completely intelligible, therefore this unrestricted act of understanding exists. So you've got these two premises, and the first thing to show is that in the set of all reality, every uh, coherent question has a correct answer, which is grounded in reality itself. And then the second thing is that's going to include, uh, you know, a unity of all answers and so forth. Eventually, you're going to get a question of everything is unity to everything else and so forth. And that cannot, that answer can't be contained in what's called physical reality. It's going to have to be contained in some kind of mentative act, like a perfect unity. So what's the implication? The implication is that consciousness and even self-consciousness is such a higher order unity, it can basically unify uh, even everything about everything if it were a purely simple unity. 
It was a pure unity. It had no intrinsic boundaries, no extrinsic boundaries. If you had a reality which was pure unity, call that mind, pure mind. Third category is, is what we call pastime arguments. Because of some developments by David Hilbert in the area of mathematics, particularly uh, what he shows is that it, you can't really have uh, a past infinity, what he calls an actual infinity of parts. Because if you have an actual infinity of parts, well, mathematics and the whole mathematization of the world falls apart. You can remove a, a, an infinite subset of parts and it's still the same yeah, yeah, size. Right. Now, once you start, uh, you know, applying, uh, you know, Hilbert's theories to the time problem, and if you hold that time is a physical reality, say in general theory of relativity, that really does have a real status, then you do actually have another chance of reconstituting, you know, uh, the finitude of past time arguments. And once you from, have a finitude of the past, you, you have to have something to start the process. Start the process. Okay, precisely. so as you look on these three philosophical arguments, mm -hmm. uh, how strong do you think they are in demonstrating the necessity of a, a creator beyond the physical world? Well, I think um, the metaphysical argument and the pure in, uh, uh, intelligibility of being arguments are really strong because I think both of them begin with you have to have at least one unconditioned reality. Wherever you see something that can be perfect uh, unity, you may be onto something that could be a so-called attribute of God. So. I agree that unconditioned existence, necessary existence, if real, would be existential bedrock. Ultimate reality, the modern metaphysical formulation of the classic unmoved mover or uncaused first cause. But even if there would be an unconditioned existence, would a traditional God be it? There seems no necessary reason, pardon the pun, there would be several candidates for unconditioned existence. Physicists know quantum fields. Gurus claim to know cosmic consciousness, and who knows what nobody knows. Moreover, analytical metaphysics may not be the only avenue by which to assess ultimate reality. Many believe that in approaching God, spiritual experiences and moral imperatives are more important than analytical arguments and doctrinal assertions. I meet a British philosopher of religion who advocates the spiritual over the analytical, John Cottingham. John, is there anything that metaphysics can do to help us understand the reality or falsity of a god? Anything. My own view on this is that it's a temptation that should be resisted. I think we can do it, but only at the cost of cutting God down to size. We, well, we want to know whether God is or is not omnipotent. Can God do anything, and what would that mean? Does God know everything? Is God free, or must God be within certain kinds of constraints? These are all questions that, if, if to me, they, they give illogical or contradictory answers, that would mean that the, the being that we think Refer to which these things call out to is doesn't exist. Well, if someone were to suggest there's some internal inconsistency in the idea of God, then it would be a philosophical responsibility for the believer to try and unpick that. But I do think that many of the traditional attributes don't actually give us that much information. We can say, for example, that God is incorporeal. Mm -hmm. What does that explain or mean well it says that what god is not he's not bodily but to say ah i've got the answer to that he's an incorporeal being i mean it it, it doesn't actually dissolve any puzzlement as to what god is or how he operates um, similarly we can say well perhaps more positively we can say god is a person mm -hmm. And that maybe is more important because it brings it closer to the moral yes. domain. But we really have no handle on what a person who is not embodied could be. 
on how you could manifest, because your personal attributes and mine are manifested through words, through gestures, through in the interaction we're having now. Well, I, I think person is, is, a, is a great example, because if God is or is not a person, defined as perhaps we can do it, will dramatically change my whole attitude towards a, a God. It's important for the believer that ultimate reality that we call God is both rational and good. Now, when you think about it, those two properties, rationality and love, are personal properties. They're properties that we understand that are at home in the human world. And it's by analogy of the, from those that we understand God to, be, to have those properties. That's as far as we can get to our knowledge of God by, by analogy. And more speculative metaphysics than that is, is though I don't have any reason to condemn it, uh, I don't myself think it's very fruitful. I myself do not like John's argument that metaphysics is not very fruitful in accessing knowledge of God. But, like it or not, he may be correct. I can only continue to explore. I have another worry. Suppose I concede and accept all the complex claims of those who argue that metaphysics can discern God. I then must ask, what is this God that metaphysics has supposedly discerned? This metaphysical God sure doesn't look like the Abrahamic God of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I put the question to philosopher of religion, Timothy O'Connor, author of Theism and Ultimate Explanation. So we have this conception of God that philosophy delivers, philosophical theology. God as a necessary being, a source of all the created reality that we see around us, uh, unlimited in power, knowledge, and so on. Uh, that, call that the God of Anselm after um, the, the famous uh, medieval uh, theologian philosopher, Saint Anselm, sort of the, the, the thinking about God as a philosophical object in, of inquiry. The greatest possible conceivable being. That's right, the greatest conceivable being, the, the pure perfection. But then, of course, religiously committed individuals have a conception of God derived from the Bible in, in Judaism and Christianity, a God who acts in human history. How do you bring those two together? Uh, this has long been thought about in both Jewish and, and Christian traditions, and I think everyone recognizes that some ways that God is depicted in the Bible cannot literally, cannot be true literal descriptions of the way God in fact is. Philosophical theologians uh, take it a, several steps further of saying a lot of our language, even language that ordinary religious individuals would think of as quite literal, is in fact to some degree anthropomorphic, making God out to be like a man and should not be taken literally. So if we say, well, God is angry, it just means he's set against injustice, say, but not in the human way that human beings uh, are set against injustice. If, but go further. What if God is outside of time? But if God is outside of time, that means there's no interaction, literally, uh, between God and any other being. And for religious purposes, that can, can, can seem troubling um, because you th uh, religious individuals who pray to God think of God as hearing their prayer right then and making decisions sometimes, uh, taking into account uh, the prayers of people. So one has to try to bring these two conceptions together, right? So we have in the, in the Jewish Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Philosophers give us the God of Anselm. The question is, can there be a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Anselm? And that's a, that's a serious question. Uh, it's not a trivial question. When we're trying to see whether we can bring these pictures together, is that the, the, the conception of God that philosophers have given to us is can be challenged at various points. I have no illusion that metaphysics can discern God, but a kind of progress can be made. By examining the most general features of the world, metaphysics may suggest a necessary being, and perfect being theology examines the subtle complexities of a greatest possible being. Metaphysics can discern whether traditional divine traits like all-powerful and all-knowing are coherent, and what to make of counterintuitive ideas like the simplicity of God. 
Metaphysics can refresh and enrich traditional arguments, such as transforming unmoved mover into unconditioned existence, though I'm not sure of the game. But metaphysics makes its own troubles. Could metaphysics distort true perceptions of God by promoting the rational and demoting the experiential? And what if the conflict between the metaphysical God of the philosophers outside of time never changing and the biblical God of Abraham in time and often changing? In quantum physics, a photon can be both a particle and a wave at the same time. Could not the supreme being, if such exists, be at the same time the God of the philosophers and the God of Abraham? Must we endure contradictions getting closer to truth? For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. Thank you.